Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is truly an honor and a pleasure for me to welcome, actually for the third time uh, to the ICD, uh, Dr. Subhachai Panachpakti. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Subhachai is uh, right now currently the Secretary General for the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. Uh, I'm also very honored to say a member of the advisory board of the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy. Allow me to say a few words about the tremendous experience and background of Dr. Subhachai. Dr. Subhachai received his PhD in Economic Planning and Developments at the Netherlands School of Economics in Rotterdam. In 1986, Dr. Subhachai was elected to the Thai Parliament and appointed Deputy Minister of Finance. In 1992, he became the Deputy Prime Minister and with the responsibility of overseeing the country's economic and trade policymaking. He was also active in shaping regional agreements, including the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation, the Association for Southeastern Asian Nations, ASEAN, and the Asia-Europe Meeting, ASEM. He has published a number of books, including Globalization and Trade in the New Millennium in 2001, and China and the WTO, Ch uh, Changing China, Changing World Trade. Dr. Subhachai served as Director General of the World Trade Organization from 2002 until 2005, and is currently serving his second term since 2005 as Secretary General of the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. The lecture topic that he's chosen for today is Current and Future Free Trade Areas, the Political, Economic, and Cultural Dimensions. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a very, very warm and sincere welcome for Dr. Supachai Panishpakti. Thank you. Good morning, uh, everyone. I was so much under the impression of uh, the keynote speaker, uh, Deputy Prime Minister Takashvili, that uh, I, I, I lost uh, the, my thread of, of thoughts uh, in, in what I was going to, to tell you. But uh, the, the topic that uh, I, I've been uh, requested to, uh, uh, to speak on will be somewhat uh, different from uh, the more exciting uh, uh, nation branding, uh, what the Deputy Prime Minister just, just talked about. Uh, mine is more about how we can cope with each other in this, in this wide world so that uh, we can have a world in which the process of, uh, of globalization could be driven uh, for the sake of mankind and not for the sake of the uh, transnational corporations or for the sakes of some of the, uh, of the wealthy uh, 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 corporations or some of the some of the major banks that uh, uh, are always kept alive, although they are just like Frankenstein. I mean, uh, walking death and 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 they can still survive. So, uh, what 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 I'm trying to do with the work that I've been involved in in the international uh, uh, arena, international com communities, is actually to try to bring countries to together. Sometimes the word like integration is being used. How to integrate? Uh, all these countries together in a global economic system so that globalization will not be like what Kofi Annan used to say, that it will lift only a few boats, uh, lift a few yachts, a few yachts, but will not lift all the, all the small uh, catamarans and all the, uh, all the rowing boats and things like that, and probably might sink even some of the smaller boats. So we would like to see globalization that can absorb countries into the process that Value, addi uh, value addition could be created, jobs could be created, that we can deal with the issues of inequality, whether it's well-based inequality, social opportunities, or inequalities because of the, because of the gender perspective. So this is, this is the kind of work that, uh, that I have been trying to do. And uh, the topic uh, uh, this morning on the uh, current and, and future trade areas and the political, economic, cultural dimension could be somewhat uh, narrow. I don't know whether you, you are really interested in that, but I'm trying to, uh, uh, to deal with it in a way that uh, you can see that, uh, uh, that, that, that there are moments in which the, uh, uh, the practice of cultural diplomacy could be, could be a great help in, in, in trying to, uh, to drive forward the kind of uh, uh, regionalism or free trade agreements uh, that can help uh, the multilateral global trading system survive at the time that uh, the multilateral system is not really operating well. So uh, just to add to what uh, Mark uh, just said from the beginning, uh, we're, we're living in a, in a very uh, complex time, at a time in which we need for complex solution, we need collective actions. 
We need countries to be working together in a, in a multilateral forum, like the United Nations, or like in G20 or G8, a uh, different kind of forum. Or certainly like in the, within the European Union, in a, in a more integrated regional integration manner. But what happens at the moment is that uh, countries tend to become uh, uh, less and less prone to the agreement that would take away their sovereign rights. Because when you go for, for multilateral actions, for example, when you deal with environment, something that Mark places so high on his agenda, and same with us at the UN, it's actually on the top of our agenda, and we just finished a big meeting, the Rio Plus 20 meeting uh, uh, last year. When you want to deal with the issues of climate change, environmental degradation, uh, one country alone or a few countries together cannot do that. The, the spin-over, the spin-off effect, the spill-over effects of, of, uh, of uh, environment degradation, pollutions, emissions of, uh, of uh, greenhouse gases, uh, these are things that you can only sequester or capture or prevent from, from, from happening or do some adaptation kind of policies when you do it together. Because when one country actually emits a lot of carbon dioxide, it just doesn't remain in that one country, but it will go all over the world. It will create the effect that the sunshine cannot come in, and so you will have all kinds of problems in, in the earth. So you can see that the, the more we are needing this kind of diplomacy, whatever kind of diplomacy, and particularly the cultural diplomacy, so that we would understand. For me, cultural diplomacy is not about really culture. It's, it's more socially oriented. It's more the understanding in terms of our social involvement, social environments that we live in, and not because of our tradition alone. You look, you look at the way European Union is trying to unite itself. It actually adopts a kind of uh, cultural unity. But cultural unity in European Union doesn't mean that you have one culture in, 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 in European Union. You have more than, you have 27 culture in there. And, and they're all diverse. So the, the, the motto uh, uh, of, 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 of uh, um, European Union is actually, um, uh, something like united in diversity. So you are united, you recognize each other uh, cultural background, but you allow for diversity. And diversity is what really uh, makes uh, mankind life so interesting. Otherwise everything becomes so, uh, uh, so customized, uh, uh, so clinical, and, and not interesting as an as environment for human, human thoughts, human inspirations to, uh, to, to flourish. Um, just something which may not have uh, much to do with what I'm going to say, but uh, in terms of uh, just getting your mind to be a little bit free from the kind of the technical terms that I'm going to use in, in, in the future, let me, let me give you some, some light-hearted uh, uh, stories about something which has uh, something to do with, I think it has something to do with cultural diplomacy, but uh, when, I, when I think back of the time uh, that United States was trying to approach China, uh, you remember this is it seems to be ages ago uh, in the in the in this probably in the 60s and the 70s when they when they had this so-called ping pong diplomacy when secretary kissinger was trying to go to china and try to talk to the the chinese government particularly the uh, the premier of, of of china in those days whose name is Zhou Enlai. i don't know whether you you remember his name or recall his name maybe before you were born actually but but this is this is a story about the kind of cultural uh, interaction that uh, that I, I used to hear from uh, Secretary Kissinger some some time ago. Uh, Kissinger used to used to, used to relay the story. I don't know if actually actually it's really uh, true or not, but if it's not true, uh, my apology because there'll be names mentioned here. So in order to 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 make his approach to China and particularly to the uh, to the Prime Minister of China Zhou Enlai a little bit less rigid, to to be more informal. Kissinger knew very well that Zhou Enlai likes to hear jokes about Russian <coughs> leaders. He likes to have jokes about Russian leaders, to, to, to know what the Russian leaders are doing. So Kissinger would always go to China with loads and loads of, uh, of jokes about Russian leaders. And, and one, one, of the, one of the jokes that Zhou Enlai likes very much was this, this kind of joke. Kissinger was telling Zhou Enlai that uh, uh, President Brezhnev, when he came into power, he became a very powerful president of, uh, of the Soviet Union. Uh, one day he invited his, uh, his mother to come to his, uh, 
his palace. He was showing her his palace, the bedrooms, all the modern equipments, how many cars he has, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the bathroom are so, so luxuriously decorated and things like that. All the luxuries he had in his, in his own, uh, own so-called uh, palace. And at the end of the day, his mother became so impressed, uh, Mrs. Brezhnev, he, she became so impressed. She said, well, look, son, I mean, I'm so pleased with what you, you've done, you achieved, but what will happen if the communists would come into all this? Well, the communists would take over our government. So this is, I don't know whether you, you're not laughing, but uh, this, is, this is what she was telling this to her son, who is the head of the Communist Party of, of Russia. So uh, this is a joke that, that Joe and, jo, jo and I likes very much, and it broke the ice in, in terms of uh, having discussion uh, between the US and, and China in those days. Now, I would say that uh, if you look at uh, the time now for the free trade, uh, uh, free trade uh, areas and the political, economic, and, and social, uh, cultural dimensions of the free trade areas, let, let me tell you briefly first the political economy of global integration. Global integration could be done uh, at the moment according to the latest political economy policies is that uh, you can do it on the three bases. One on the basis of multilateral negotiations. And this is done through the World Trade Organization as you can see at the moment. It has more than 130 members, I think 153 members, something like that. Uh, Georgia has been a, a member for, for some time and Russia just joined last year. Uh, so it's still expanding because at the UN we have more than 190 members. So before the WTO will become universal to include everyone, it has still a long way to go. It's now from 150 uh, to 190 if they want to incorporate uh, everyone into the whole system. The second dimension of the uh, process of integration is through what we call the FTAs, the free trade uh, agreements, the regional uh, trade agreements, the FTAs, the RTAs, or some, sometimes what people call PTA, the Preferential Trade Agreement, the PTA. Because uh, uh, these FTAs and, and RTAs do produce the kind of arrangement that are concessional for each other, preferential for each other. So if you are a member of a FTA or a member of RTA, you get spatial treatments. Your, your, your products can, uh, can come in more easily, uh, low rates uh, with no, uh, no rules and regulation, no requirement on packaging, no requirement on, on uh, uh, certain uh, security issues and things like that. So when you are in the same, uh, in the same uh, FTA, uh, people, people call it the uh, preferential treatment. So it's sometimes called PTA uh, instead of FTA. And then you have uh, the third dimension uh, of, of, of globalization and global integration, which is called unilateralism. Unilateralism indicates that uh, there are countries around the world, and countries like Georgia, which has been doing very well in terms of carrying out our own uh, reform process, in opening up on our own, in, in making life easy for people to do business. That's why the World Bank has been producing this annual report of the ease in doing business that Georgia is standing up so high, uh, rank, uh, is, is, is being ranked uh, so high in the, uh, in the table. And so uh, in, in unilateral policy making, people tend to have their own space. You can do things that you think this is just right for you. This is my own recipe. This is my own autonomy. This is my own policy space. This is what we call this at the UN, at ANGTAD, we call it policy space. And countries will have to be afforded a certain degree of policy space. So in spite of all the multilateralism that we need, in spite of the regionalism that we do to the free trade arrangement, we also need unilateralism to be allow certain flexibility and freedom so that this can give you the full reign of, of, of your own ins aspirations, your own imagination, and to be able to do things that are just directly harmonized with the need of your own economy. This is very important. So you have the three dimensions of multilateralism, regionalism, which is probably expressed mainly to the free trade uh, 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 areas, and the unilateralism, which is uh, 
uh, more or less based on the country's own drive and, and, and autonomous effort. Now, if you talk to my former colleagues at the WTO, the World Trade Organization, they'll be telling you that their best, their best uh, uh, means of uh, integration is through the first dimension of multilateral agreement. And that is why the WTO has been actually established to bring people together so that multilateral rules, global rules in investment, in agriculture, in trade, <clears throat> in, in, in trade-related intellectual property rights agreement, in so, all sorts of areas that we can have rules that we can abide by. Because trade without rules will be really quite messy and confusing. There will be people who, who abuse uh, their position, or there will be people who do the sort of policies, what we call beggar thy neighbor, do something that actually uh, uh, make life easier for your own people, but produce things that are, uh, are less positive for your neighbor. For example, in trying to undervalue your own currency. These are, these are some of the things that are happening these days, that when people do undervalue their currency so much, they are trying to make their own products more, more, more attractive, while at the same time to make the products of other currency areas more expensive. I will come back to this uh, later on, but let's say that there are a lot of areas in which you can do policies that can help your own region and at the same time help the rest of the world as well. But uh, the, the WTO believes mainly in, in multilateralism. Regionalism is being practiced more and more these days. There are at the moment more than 546, there are 546 FTAs notified to the WTO today. Uh, January 2013, 546 uh, FTAs, RTAs, and there are 354 FTAs, 354, that are still operating. Of course, a lot has been notified, but never really uh, come to fruition, because sometimes people go off to do their own FTAs, negotiation here, left and right, and, 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 and not being uh, brought into, into operation. So, but. The, the, the impressive thing is that uh, there are still more than 350, 350 FTAs in operation. So it's a huge amount. It's, it's a huge amount. If you compare this to the multilateral rounds, there have been eight multilateral rounds in the past. You remember uh, the kind of the Uruguay round was the last round, was the eighth round, the Uruguay round. We are uh, going through one of the most uh, acrimonious round that we've been seeing. This is so-called Doha Development Agenda, Doha round, what they call. This has been going on for the last 12 years already, and it's not finished. The Uruguay round took longer to finish. It was finished in eight years. This one is going to beat all the other rounds records. Most of the rounds in the past, Kennedy rounds, Tokyo rounds, all these rounds finished by two or three years. They're all finished. But the Uruguay round was very complicated, and now this round, people say it might not be finished at all. So what we are seeing at the moment is that uh, maybe because of the failure of the multilateral solutions and dimensions, or not fully failures, but because of the, 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 the rigidity and also the difficulty, the complexity. You see, when you deal with 150 countries to reach a single undertaking solution that everyone has to agree together and a package of 20 negotiating points, ranging from agriculture to non-agriculture, to manufacturing, uh, to subsidy codes, uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, trade facilitation, to intellectual property rights. These are all on its own, each very complicated issue. But when you put them together and you say all this will have to be agreed by 150 countries at the same time, and then you finish around, it's become well nigh impossible these days. So what is happening with a multilateral solution is that uh, we may be seeing some stalling, uh, what they call st uh, stalemate at the moment. Uh, it has been stuck uh, for a few years, and this year we are going uh, for the, uh, I think it's a eight or nine ministerial meeting of the WTO in Bali, in Indonesia, uh, to try to push this agenda forward. So the agenda may be pushed forward, but not based on what we call multilateralism, but maybe on the basis of plurilateralism, which means that if you can't have all the 150 countries joining in a single undertaking, let's say, who is ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Then you join. The rest, you're not ready, you stay aside. And then when we trash out our own agreements, this becomes the next difficult uh, part of, of, of the plurilateral solution. 
When we finish the plurilateral negotiation, for example, what they are doing in Geneva at the moment is to try to trash out the plurilateral negotiation on services. This is one of the most intricate, complicated kind of negotiations that we're seeing because, as you know, services uh, are wide-ranging. Services can mean transportation, services can mean insurance, can mean finance, can mean IC, can mean so many things, can mean education, can mean health. So the GATS, the, the, the general agreement on trade and services is one of the most complex issues. And it doesn't involve only the border issues, meaning the custom procedures and also the regulations at the borders and, and the tariffs line and things like that, but it involves in services negotiation or inside the border uh, kind of rules and regulations. So uh, trade rules, investment rule, competition rules, uh, uh, um, uh, educational uh, requirement, qualification, transportation network rules, and all these other things are going to be involved. So what I'm trying to say is that why multilateralism is not functioning fully well or fully effective at the moment, people are trying to make use of plurilateral. So maybe you are going to see in Bali in the next couple of months the kind of negotiations that might be concluded among a select group of countries, maybe 20 to 30 countries out of the 150, on this services agreement. Now the question then is that if, a big if, uh, I don't think there will be a real agreement by that time, but it's in the making anyway. But if there would be an agreement on GATS, the, the General Agreement on Trade and, and Services, what happens now with that agreement? Is it going to be conditional or unconditional? Conditional meaning that you will have to be part of the agreement to be able to exceed the different uh, concessions that are inscribed into the, into the agreement. But unconditional means that if you are a member of the WTO, you can always be uh, acceding to some of these agreements which are, uh, are actually agreed by the, the WTO members without any, any preconditions. So these are, these are the kind of things because uh, with plurilateralism, people fear the so-called free riders issues. In cultural diplomacy, free riders is something that uh, sometime you may need to use more, uh, more diplomacy, cultural diplomacies to be able to turn free riders into the real uh, signatory of, 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 a, of a agreement. Because free riders are those who do not want to be involved in negotiation. They don't want to be involved in, in give and take. They want to take alone. Now, in cultural diplomacy, to take alone and not to give and not to listen to others and not to be able to be thoughtful and constructive, it's something which is very difficult to practice. So maybe something will have to be done there in terms of cultural diplomacy so that we can approach multilateral, multilateralism through plurilateralism in a way that we can use plurilateralism as a, as a means uh, towards a multilateral uh, solution. Now, but in the meantime, in the meantime, the second dimension of regionalism or free trade arrangement is now, is now taking off in a very, uh, in, a, in, in a very profligate manner, in, in something that is, cannot be controlled. Now, uh, there are now uh, research results uh, that sometimes go to show that in neutral terms, let's say in, a, in an impassionate terms, which of the three dimensions of multilateralism, regionalism, or unilateralism produce the, 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 I would say, the most efficient solutions to trade liberalization? Now, you would have thought that multilateralism, uh, multilateral negotiation, had produced a larger result, but it's, it's not like that. It turns out that uh, 50 to 60 percent of liberalization efforts throughout the world are committed through unilateral action. That countries themselves decide that this is opening up the financial areas, it's good for you. So you allow banks to come and own and you have less of the degree of control on the shareholding proportion. When more banks participate, it means more lending efforts and people can gain access to the financial system. It becomes something which has made, has made people uh, uh, facilitate people to trade more and to invest more and can create more jobs. So, uh, Sometimes countries do that on a unilateral basis. They don't have to be forced by regional agreement or multilateral agreement. So uh, some of the analysis been done by the World Bank, and it shows that about 50 to 60 percent of the global liberalization effort have been done on a unilateral basis. Only 20 to 30 percent uh, are being done on the basis of regionalism. 
and the rest, about 10 to 20 percent, are done through the process of multilateral processes. This is really a, a, a big surprise, a, a great surprise, because we always, we always think that the multilateral effort will be the one that drive forward the kind of trade liberalization. It turns out to be that regional agreements and also, mul also unilateral drive policies which are always uh, thought to be the kind of uh, uh, autonomous and policy space that I talk to, your own determination of your own destiny. This is a major driving force. So this resource has given more stimulus, more impetus to the way that people are doing things on their own, are doing with, with countries in the same region, or now they do it across the region. Across the region. For example, uh, for example you can see Mexico. Mexico is a country which has been dealing in FTAs. Mexico must have more than 30 FTAs, or, or maybe even more than 30 FTAs. Uh, they, they, instead of relying on the uh, MFN, the most favored nation treatment through the WTO, Mexico doesn't have anything as MFN. They have all concessional or preferential treatments in one form or another. Uh, if, you look, if you look at the, uh, the way the global community is now being driven by more than 350 uh, FTAs and RTAs, you would see that there's very little room now for the MFN, the most favored nation you see. MFN means the best treatment that you give to one country, you have to give to the rest of the world. So this is, this is single, and uh, this is a global undertaking that you have to do when you're a member of the World Trade Organization. But what we are seeing is that the concessional terms of, of agreement are becoming the predominant forces. Now, when countries go into a joint undertaking in a regional arrangement, like in the European Union, I call regional, this is, this is a mother of all integration, the European Union, this is a mother of all integration because it started off uh, as something which is uh, very small on the basis of coal and steel association, and it started off as a political uh, motivation to keep, to keep European nations together instead of, uh, of, of trying to, if, if the, people used to say, if goods do not cross the borders, then armed forces will cross the border. So uh, for, for Europe to stay peaceful, uh, this European Union is, is very much needed. So European Union, for me, is the mother of all the uh, economic integration. And it shows so uh, fully well that in this case of, of, of European Union, when you do the kind of rule making, or when you have the kind of, uh, of standardization of certain products, or when you have a kind of uh, standardization of custom procedures, immigration, and the standardization has gone as far as the currency area. So you facilitate all sorts of, not only trade facilitation, but movement of people, movement of capitals, and also movement of creative products of thinking. Literature, songs, entertainments, digital uh, uh, products and things like that. So you produce something which has actually been able to reduce frictions and costs in doing trade. But at the same time, at the same time, you create certain environments that will need people to be more or less looking and working with each other under some kind of single rules and regulation, which has become uh, something which is not always easy because you have not actually uh, become a federation of, of European nations like United States of America. You are not United States. You're not seeing United States of, of, of Europe. This is what Europe has to be evolved into the United States of Europe, but otherwise not so. But Europe is still being held together, now more so with the need to have the survival of the, of the single currency. Whether it's a right approach or not, nobody knows, and nobody questions at the moment. But it has to survive, because if it doesn't survive, then it means that the whole disintegration of Europe will happen, and you don't, you don't know what's going to happen. I used to have several visits uh, to see different European leaders, and uh, one of the leaders I, I used to talk to at length was the, the former Chancellor of, of, of Germany, uh, Chancellor Schröder. And uh, in those days, uh, I was trying to uh, convince Europe to agree on the rationalization of the uh, common agricultural policy, the cap, you know. The cap of Europe cost Europe half of its budget. It's just wasteful. Half of the European budget, uh, the European Union budget, is spent on subsidizing farmers. And this subsidy is, is, is huge, it's about, at the moment, more than 360 billion, one billion dollars per day for, for farmers' subsidies in Europe. So uh, we are trying to negotiate for Europe to reduce 
the kind of uh, subsidies that uh, for us it remains something which is not not useful because it's what we call price distortings. It actually kills off the initiatives of the poor countries to compete because if you subsidize your own prices, poor countries which do not have their own uh, budget cannot cannot compete in terms of subsidizing their own uh, uh, pricing policy, and so they cannot compete. So I used to go and visit both at that time. It was President Chirac in uh, in. in in France and, and, and Chancellor Schroeder here in Germany. And you know, uh, I was trying to convince, uh, of course, President Chirac, I cannot convince him. I talked to him several times and he said, look, you know, just don't, don't you convince United States. You know, our agriculture policy is the best in the world. We produce the best quality of food. Look at the food that US produce. It's called Frankenstein food. He said, this is a food that you don't consume. You give it to the animals. This is the GMO, genetically modified uh, products. We produce the best. So I had several, several discussions with him and cannot convince him to stay away. Because I said, what, what we would like to see is that you can subsidize your farmers, but don't subsidize the prices. If you want your farmers to take good care of the farms because of the touristic uh, attractions, because you want people to still habita uh, habitate the farms, you do that. You give, you give income to the farmer, but don't subsidize of the, the pricing. So. I thought I would come to see Chancellor Schroeder and convince him to help me convince uh, President uh, Girac using the kind of uh, diplomacy that they can use within the EU system. You know, what Pres you know what Chancellor Schroeder was telling me? He said, look, I mean, I agree. We in Germany, we try to reduce subsidy anyway. That's what we do. But let me not, uh, let me not try to convince our colleagues in France. The thing that we do at the moment, our prime goal for Germany in, in Europe is to keep France in Europe. This is our prime goal, is to keep France in Europe. You know why? Because the, if the two of us live separately, you see things happen in the past, uh, two world wars, a lot of conflicts, millions of people killed, we cannot allow that to happen again. So what you're talking about, cultural diplomacy, political, uh, economic means, uh, for Europe, it just equally economic, financial, as well as political means. Europe cannot just disintegrate like that. So we are seeing as people are trying to speculate, will Greece go out of the European Union? Of course, economists like myself would say the best solution for Greece is to go out of the European Union, but the political, political solution would not allow that to happen will not allow that to happen. So what is happening now is that, of course, they will try to, to rescue the, uh, the, the solution, which is going to take much longer than it is. But I'm saying all this uh, just to explain to you that regionalism exists. It exists and it has been performing on an uneven basis. It has to reduce the cost of transaction in Europe, but it has come unstuck because of the unfinished agenda. Now. If we go on with this kind of discussion on the new generation of free trade uh, agreements, uh, the, the new generation meaning what they call the 21st, uh, uh, 21st century uh, FTAs, RT, uh, RTAs, then we do see that all these agreements are not actually being called FTAs anymore. They're not called, they're not called RTAs or FTAs anymore. They are like Europe at the moment. They are what we call comprehensive economic partnership agreement, comprehensive economic partnership agreement, which stretches beyond just trade market access. Stress, uh, be, uh, it, it, it actually ranges beyond the, the market access of trade. It goes even beyond financial integration. It will go into economic cooperation. It will go into, into the, 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 the immigration, the mobility of people, of human resources, it will go into the full-fledged services agreement in transportation, even in healthcare, in education, in things that you sometimes tend, we would sometimes tend to think it belongs to the arena of national policies and cultural backgrounds that would determine our natural policies. But what we are seeing at the moment, and some of the new, some of the new, uh, before I, before I, I uh, I end, and we should have some uh, of your your question and comments. Uh, what we call the comprehensive economic partnership agreement or deeper uh, regional integration would indicate that the kind of tariff negotiations, the trade uh, tariffs, uh, the uh, uh, the kind of subsidy codes agreement, uh, and things like that, will become something of the past. 
What they are going to negotiate on for the more comprehensive and deeper integration in the new, in, in, in the new generation will be more rule-making exercise. You are seeing what rule-making exercise could actually lead to, like the Rio plus 20 kind of negotiations. It will be rule-making exercise on how to produce a so-called green economy. How can we produce a green economy? Can we do it by the so-called border taxation of those products that emit or results in emission of, of greenhouse gases? Or we do it in terms of having, uh, let's say, the, uh, the global market uh, for, 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 for carbon dioxide. So that within the global market, we can have quota system, we can have auction system, so that we can auction off the quota to produce, to emit carbon dioxide to a certain limit in comparison to what you need in your own countries. And if you need more than that, you can come into the auction and buy more, and you pay for it. And the funds that are derived from, from auctioneering uh, all this uh, carbon dioxide can be put into the green fund, so that the green fund could be helped to generate more technology, more capital goods that would help to reduce carbon dioxide emitting production, uh, production uh, uh, methods. So in, in doing clean, what we call clean mechanism for production, this green fund can be put into. So this is, this is a big area of, 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 of new generation of economic integration that would involve uh, not, only, not only trade, uh, but I would say in environment, in public goods in general. There will be countries that are involved in, uh, in, in, in regional integration to be able to finish, to complete the transportation network so that uh, you can have a full-fledged uh, multimodal transport uh, system that will facilitate trade even more. You can have the regional integration to facilitate financial integration, not so much in terms of having a single currency unit, but can do things like pooling reserves together can help to even out the kind of hedge fund speculations, uh, like I was talking about uh, in the beginning about beggar thy neighbor policies. To be able to fight against beggar thy neighbor policies, it might be more convenient for, for groups of countries to be jointly operating a common fund so that whatever happens in the, in the, in the uh, I would say, the nominal currency market could be even out by the kind of intervention so that the real exchange rates could be maintained. I don't want to go into economic discussion of real and nominal uh, uh, exchange rates, but let me say that the real exchange rates are the exchange rate that will reflect a country's competitiveness, not the exchange rate that you see in the market this day. These are not exchange rates that reflect the competitiveness. It reflects many things like uh, balance of payment, uh, position, speculation, carry trade, uh, m many things. So at the moment, it also reflects a quantitative easing that produces a lot of liquidity around the world that spread into other countries and drive countries' currencies up and down. And so it, it is not only reflective of the real competitive strengths of an economy. Uh, let, let me uh, end by uh, saying that in order to, uh, in order to have uh, uh, the kind of uh, the deeper integration in a way that it would help to, uh, to serve uh, the global integration, we have to understand some of the implication. Let me start by something which is uh, less complicated by the cultural dimension of, uh, of the deep integration. The model that Europe is towing, united in diversity, is, is the motto that we should be doing. We should be looking at cultural exchanges, trying to be united in the way we understand each other, but not to have a uniformity uh, in terms of our own culture in diversity. So uh, th there is one, uh, one uh, area in which uh, we have, a, uh, we have a, a major agreement, which is a U UNESCO agreement uh, in the areas of Convention on the Protection and Promotion of the Diversity of Cultural Expression. Cultural expression. So whatever you do in terms of uh, movies, film, television, uh, literature, songs, these are areas in which as much as you can be involved in free trade arrangement or regional trade agreement to liberalize services, as they're now trying to do with the, uh, with the WTO Doha arrangement, you can have certain protection on your own cultural diversity. This is very crucial. This is a global, this is what sometimes people say, it clashes between UNESCO cultural dimension and the WTO trade dimension, multilateral dimension. So, but at the moment, at the moment, what we agreed upon is that we are united 
in diversity. So uh, much as we want to free up trade in services, we allow certain level of protection for the rights for countries to help their own film industries, uh, 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 cultural services and creative services industries, for example. Uh, and I do see, I do see also that the regional integration is taking up more cultural and social dimension as I see the effort on the revival of the Silk Road trade. I don't know whether you've been following this, but uh, the Silk Road, uh, which uh, used to date back in the, I don't know, since the uh, years of 500 uh, 80s, in the first century, uh, going back from first to the second century, uh, 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 sorry, the first to the second millennium, uh, from 500 uh, AD to around about 1500 uh, AD, uh, Silk Road that uh, links uh, not only from China, actually the Silk Road will come all the way from, from, from uh, Korea and close to Japan, through China mainland, and also around the, around the, uh, the Pacific Ocean down south into the Indian Ocean, reaching both European areas in areas of uh, in, in Venice, uh, through the Central Asian parts, both by land and by sea. And by land, we are now recreating all the major cities. We are now working with all the major cities from, from, from Korea to China to, to Central Asian nations uh, way into Europe to revive the kind of traditions from the old days of trading with each other. Not to revive only the touristic kind of, uh, of, 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 uh, of integration, but also in, in recreating the routes and the facilities that people can 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 use the routes uh, to uh, to intensify their, uh, their, their 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 activities. Not only trade, but movements of people. And we're not approaching this in the in, in at the level of national uh, boundaries. We're approaching that as if there would be no national boundaries. There will be only cities, and cities can join hands in trying to make life easier for for for, for traders and and commuters and and travelers. We are seeing uh, a lot of political dimension in the in the uh, in the new. Uh, uh, FTAs and, and mainly if you look at the recent announcement by President Obama in his State of the Union address uh, some weeks ago, he mentioned uh, the so-called transatlantic trade and investment uh, partnership, transatlantic trade and investment partnership. You see how things are evolving. In the past it will be called trans uh, transatlantic uh, trade uh, agreement. This is now called trade and investment partnership. It's a partnership. This has been something that the European leaders have been calling for years. There have been speeches made by European leaders for years on transnational, transatlantic trade uh, partnership. But it has not ever come to fruition. But this is the first time that the US president has mentioned this. And this is in the light of some of the political implications. Why? Because you are seeing between Europe and United States the kind of trade relationship that has been diluted from years to years. These used to be major trading partners. Now, what they have as major trading partner is China. And not only China, but China and the rest of the BRICS nation. China and Brazil and India and, uh, and, uh, and, and Russia and now also uh, Brazil and also South, uh, South Africa. So when you see that the chair of markets between the two nations or two areas like United States and, and Europe being reduced from year to years and uh, the third part is coming up, they feel now the time has come to revive the kind of the, uh, the, the, the more integrated marketplace that used to be. This cover one third of the market of the world. US and EU is about one third of the world. It's one half of the global output, but one third of the, of the, of the trade. So uh, this has been driven more or less by the kind of uh, emerging of the emerging world, of the emerging countries, the emergence of the emerging worlds, uh, the newly, what, not really developed countries, but developing countries like China and the BRICS that are coming up, gaining a lot in terms of, of, of trade, uh, of trade and, uh, and development role. The trade that is, that is involved by the, uh, by the emerging countries now cover more than half. The open countries are now trading among themselves more than they trade with the rest of the world. So this is becoming a major area. And the political reason is that when the US and the EU used to control the World Trade Organization and produced rules and regulations according to their own image, 
uh, you look at the TRIPS arrangement, the intellectual property rights arrangement, it was, it was really modeled after the US intellectual property rights agreement. So now that they think they cannot make any advances at the World Trade Organization, they are doing their own kind of rulemaking exercise outside of the WTO so that this can be done on the basis of what they would like to see as a WTO plus plus agreement. Because what the US would like to see from the WTO is, for example, the multilateralization of, of transparency in, in, in government procurement, which is not so in the WTO. At the moment, transparency in government procurement is only plurilateral agreement within the WTO. US would like to see it being multilateralized, that everyone would take place. US would like to see less of an attachment to the so-called geographical indications that the European nations would like to attach themselves to. All the brand names like feta cheese from Greece and, uh, and, and the uh, Parma ham from Italy, US wouldn't like to see this because US coming from the new world, they don't want to see the old world traditions to determine the way that they want to compete. So the geographical indications become a, a heavily intensive kind of debates that are very divisive at the WTO. US would like to get rid of that so that they can agree on. US would like to see the diversities in cultural activities being more limited because US would like to sell more movies and films and television uh, series to Europe, which is being protected. So they would like to have European Union in agreement with them on services. So that's why the transatlantic trade and investment uh, partnership is being conceived. They said they would do it in two years. I think maybe 10, 20 years would be the, the right thing to do, but at least there's a start to it. And this is actually uh, uh, deterministic of what is happening around the world. Besides the transatlantic uh, negotiation, you are seeing what they call trans-Pacific partnership agreement, the TPP also. Uh, uh, taking place at the same time. But I have actually uh, been uh, too, too extensive in the way I try to confuse you with all these things, but uh, l let me make uh, this clear that uh, while we have the three dimension of multilateralism, regionalism, and unilateralism, all three are important, and uh, n none of which uh, should be disregarded, but of course at the moment it's driven more by unilateral actions by countries. Regionalism is now being driven more by rulemaking exercise. It's driven more by the major powers that are trying to make rulemaking exercise outside of the WTO. As countries are now trying to become members of the WTO, the WTO cannot manage the single undertaking exercise to have multilateral solutions for many of the things that they are trying to do. So there are a lot of now undertakings through the FTAs, RTAs, that will resolve your rulemakings outside. The political implication for this is that the WTO will become less and less meaningful, and this we have to we have to correct. This we have to adjust. The WTO cannot become uh, obsolete; it cannot be diluted. We have to find ways to strengthen the WTO, and we are not trying to do that. But at the same time, we have to take into account that rulemaking exercises that are done only on regional basis, but would be multi multilateralized, because if the U.S. and the EU would agree on certain rules on, let's say, on S SPS sanitary and phytosanitary undertaking, the rest of the world may have to take that into account because if they want to trade with one third of the world market, they may have to accept this. And can we all accept this? Because the standards are different standards because of different economic, cultural, social uh, background. So these are things that uh, uh, I would like to leave with you. Uh, Mark, I have gone too far again and too long, but I hope there's some time for some questions and comments. Thank you very much for your attention.